Bunter raised himself a little, and looking straight into Captain John's eyes, said, in a very distinct whisper, You were right. He fell back and closed his eyes. Not a word more could Captain John's get out of him, and the steward coming into the cabin, the skipper withdrew. But that very night, unobserved, Captain John's, opening the door cautiously, entered again the mate's cabin. He could wait no longer. The suppressed eagerness, the excitement expressed in all his mean, creeping little person did not escape the chief mate, who was lying awake, looking frightfully pulled down and perfectly impassive. "'You are coming to gloat over me, I suppose,' said Bunter, without moving, and yet making a palpable hit. "'Bless my soul!' exclaimed Captain Johns with a start, and assuming a sober demeanor. "'There's a thing to say.' "'Well, gloat, then. You and your ghosts, you've managed to get over a live man.' This was said by Bunter without stirring, in a low voice, and with much expression. "'Do you mean to say,' inquired Captain Johns, in an awestruck whisper, "'that you had a supernatural experience that night? You saw an apparition, then, on board my ship?' Reluctance, shame, disgust would have been visible on poor Bunter's countenance if the greater part of it had not been swathed up in cotton wool and bandages. His ebony eyebrows, more sinister than ever amongst all that lot of white linen, came together in a frown as he made a mighty effort to say, Yes, I have seen. The wretchedness in his eyes would have awakened the compassion of any other man than Captain Johns. But Captain Johns was all agog with triumphant excitement. He was just a little bit frightened, too. He looked at that unbelieving scoffer laid low, and did not even dimly guess at his profound, humiliating distress. He was not generally capable of taking much part in the anguish of his fellow creatures. This time, moreover, he was excessively anxious to know what had happened. Fixing his credulous eyes on the bandaged head, he asked, trembling slightly, and did it, did it knock you down? Come, am I the sort of man to be knocked down by a ghost? protested Bunter in a little stronger tone. Don't you remember what you said yourself the other night? Better men than me? Ha! You'll have to look a long time before you find a better man for a mate of your ship. Captain Johns pointed a solemn finger at Bunter's bedplace. You've been terrified, he said. That's what's the matter. You've been terrified. Why, even the man at the wheel was scared, though he couldn't see anything. He felt the supernatural. You are punished for your incredulity, Mr. Bunter. You were terrified. And suppose I was, said Bunter. Do you know what I had seen? Can you conceive the sort of ghost that would haunt a man like me? Do you think it was a ladyish afternoon call? Another cup of tea, please, apparition? The visits your professor cranks? And that journalist chap you are always talking about? No, I can't tell you what it was like. Every man has his own ghosts. You couldn't conceive. Bunter stopped, out of breath, and Captain Johns remarked, with the glow of inward satisfaction reflected in his tone, I've always thought you were the sort of man that was ready for anything from pitch and toss to willful murder, as the saying goes. Well, well, so you were terrified. I stepped back, said Bunter curtly. I don't remember anything else. The man at the wheel told me you went backwards as if something had hit you. It was a sort of inward blow, explained Bunter. Something too deep for you, Captain Johns, to understand. Your life and mine haven't been the same. "'Aren't you satisfied to see me converted?' "'And you can't tell me any more?' asked Captain Johns anxiously. 
No, I can't. I wouldn't. It would be no use if I did. That sort of experience must be gone through. Say I am being punished. Well, I take my punishment, but talk of it I won't. Very well, said Captain Johns. You won't. But mind, I can draw my own conclusions from that. Draw what you like, but be careful what you say, sir. You don't terrify me. You aren't a ghost. One word. Has it any connection with what you said to me on that last night, when we had talked together on spiritualism? Bunter looked weary and puzzled. What did I say? You told me that I couldn't know what a man like you was capable of. Yes, yes, enough. Very good. I am fixed, then, remarked Captain Johns. All I say is that I am jolly glad not to be you, though I would have given almost anything for the privilege of personal communication with the world of spirits. Yes, sir, but not in that way. Poor Bunter moaned pitifully. It has made me feel twenty years older. Captain Johns retired quietly. He was delighted to observe that his overbearing ruffian humbled to the dust by the moralizing agency of the spirits. The whole occurrence was a source of pride and gratification, and he began to feel a sort of regard for his chief mate. It is true that in further interviews Butter showed himself very mild and deferential. He seemed to cling to his captain for spiritual protection. He used to send for him and say, I feel so nervous, and Captain Johns would stay patiently for hours in the hot little cabin and feel proud of the call. For Mr. Bunter was ill and could not leave his berth for a good many days. He became a convinced spiritualist. Not enthusiastically, that could hardly have been expected from him, but in a grim, unshakable way. He could not be called exactly friendly to the disembodied inhabitants of our globe, as Captain Johns was. But he was now a firm, if gloomy, recruit of spiritualism. One afternoon, as the ship was already well to north in the Gulf of Bengal, the steward knocked at the door of the captain's cabin and said, without opening it, The mate asks if you could spare him a moment, sir. He seems to be in a state there. Captain Johns jumped up from the couch at once. Yes, tell him I am coming. He thought, could it be possible there had been another spiritual manifestation in the daytime, too? He reveled in the hope. It was not exactly that, however. Still, Bunter, whom he saw sitting, collapsed in a chair. He had been up for several days, but not on deck, as yet. Poor Bunter had something startling enough to communicate. His hands covered his face. His legs were stretched straight out dismally. "'What's the news now?' croaked Captain Johns, not unkindly, because in truth it always pleased him to see Bunter, as he expressed it, tamed. News, exclaimed the crushed skeptic through his hands. A hey, news enough, Captain Johns. Who will be able to deny the awfulness, the genuineness? Another man would have dropped dead. You want to know what I had seen? All I can tell you is that since I've seen it, my hair is turning white. Bunter detached his hands from his face, and they hung on each side of his chair as if dead. He looked broken in the dusky cabin. You don't say, stammered out Captain Johns, turned white. Hold on a bit. I'll light the lamp. When the lamp was lit, the startling phenomenon could be seen plainly enough, as if the dread, the horror, and the anguish of the supernatural were being exhaled through the pores of his skin, a sort of silvery mist seemed to cling to the cheeks and the head of the mate. His short beard, his cropped hair, were growing not black, but gray, almost white. But when Mr. Bunter, thin-faced and shaky, 
came on deck for duty, he was clean-shaven, and his head was white. The hands were awestruck. Another man, they whispered to each other. It was generally and mysteriously agreed that the mate had seen something, with the exception of the man at the wheel at the time, who maintained that the mate was struck by something. This distinction hardly amounted to a difference. On the other hand, everybody admitted that, after he picked up his strength a bit, he seemed even smarter in his movements than before. One day in Calcutta, Captain Johns, pointing out to a visitor his white-headed chief mate standing by the main hatch, was heard to say, oracularly, That man's in the prime of his life. Of course, while Bunter was away, I called regularly on Mrs. Bunter every Saturday, just to see whether she had any use for my services. It was understood I would do that. She had just his half pay to live on. It amounted to about a pound a week. She had taken one room in a quiet little square in the East End. And this was affluence to what I had heard that the couple were reduced to for a time after Bunter had to give up the Western Ocean trade. He used to go as mate of all sorts of hard packets after he lost his ship and his luck together. It was affluence to that time when Bunter would start at seven o'clock in the morning with but a glass of hot water and a crust of dry bread. It won't stand thinking about, especially for those who know Mrs. Bunter. I had seen something of them, too, at that time, and it just makes me shudder to remember what that born lady had put up with. Enough. Dear Mrs. Bunter used to worry a good deal after the sapphire I left for Calcutta. She would say to me, It must be so awful for poor Winston. Winston is Bunter's name, and I tried to comfort her the best I could. Afterwards, she got some small children to teach in a family, and was half the day with them, and the occupation was good for her. In the very first letter she had from Calcutta, Bunner told her he had had a fall down the poop ladder and cut his head, but no bones broken, thank God. That was all. Of course, she had other letters from him, but that vagabond Bunter never gave me a scratch of the pen the solid eleven months. I supposed, naturally, that everything was going on all right. Who could imagine what was happening? Then one day Mrs. Bunter got a letter from a legal firm in the city advising her that her uncle was dead. Her old curmudgeon of an uncle, a retired stockbroker, a heartless, petrified antiquity that had lasted on and on. He was nearly ninety, I believe, and if I were to meet his venerable ghost this minute, I would try to take him by the throat and strangle him. The old beast would never forgive his niece for marrying Bunter, and years afterwards, when people made a point of letting him know that she was in London, pretty nearly starving at forty years of age, he only said, serve the little fool right. I believe he meant her to starve, and lo and behold, the old cannibal died intestate, with no other relatives but that very identical little fool. The Bunters were wealthy people now. Of course, Mrs. Bunter wept as if her heart would break. In any other woman, it would have been mere hypocrisy. Naturally, too, she wanted to cable the news to her Winston in Calcutta. But I showed her, Gazette in hand, that the ship was on the homeward bound list for more than a week already. So we sat down to wait, and talked meantime of dear old Winston every day. There was just one hundred such days before the sapphire got reported all well in the chops of the channel by an incoming mail boat. I am going to Dunkirk to meet him, she says. The sapphire had a cargo of jute for Dunkirk. Of course, I had to escort the dear lady and the quality of her ingenious friend. 
She calls me our ingenious friend to this day, and I've observed some people, strangers, looking hard at me for the signs of the ingenuity, I suppose. After settling Mrs. Bunter into a good hotel in Dunkirk, I walked down to the docks. Late in afternoon, it was, and what was my surprise to see the ship actually fast alongside. Either Johns or Bunter or both must have been driving her hard up channel. Anyway, she had been in since the day before last, and her crew was already paid off. I met two of her apprenticed boys going off home on leave with their dunnage on a Frenchman's barrow, as happy as larks, and I asked them if the mate was on board. There he is on the quay looking at the moors, says one of the youngsters as he skipped past me. You may imagine the shock to my feelings when I beheld his white head. I could only manage to tell him that his wife was at an hotel in town. He left me at once to go and get his hat on board. I was mightily surprised by the smartness of his movements as he hurried up the gangway, whereas the black mate struck people as deliberate and strangely stately in his gait for a man in the prime of life, this white-headed chap seemed the most wonderfully alert of old men. I don't suppose Bunter was any quicker on his pins than before. It was the color of the hair that made all the difference in one's judgment. The same with his eyes. Those eyes that looked at you so steely, so fierce, and so fascinating, out of a bush of a buccaneer's black hair, now had an innocent, almost boyish expression and their good-humored brightness under those white eyebrows. I led him without any delay into Mrs. Bunter's private sitting-room. After she had dropped a tear over the late cannibal, given a hug to her Winston, and told him that he must grow his mustache again, the dear lady tucked her feet upon the sofa, and I got out of Bunter's way. He started at once to pace the room, waving his long arms. He worked himself into a regular frenzy, and tore John's limb from limb many times over that evening. Fell down, of course I fell down, by slipping backward on that fool's patent brass plates. Upon my word, I had been walking that poop in charge of the ship, and I didn't know whether I was in the Indian Ocean or in the moon. I was crazy. My head spun round and round with sheer worry. I had made my last application of your chemist's wonderful stuff, this to me. All the store of bottles you gave me got smashed when those drawers fell out in that last gale. I had been getting some dry things to change when I heard the cry, all hands on deck, and made one jump of it, without even pushing them in properly. Ass! When I came back and saw the broken glass and the mess, I felt ready to faint. No, look here, deception is bad, but not to be able to keep it up after one has been forced into it. You know that since I've been squeezed out of the Western Ocean packets by younger men, just on account of my grizzled muzzle, you know how much chance I had to get a ship, and not a soul to turn to. We have been a lonely couple, we two. She threw away everything for me, and to see her want a piece of dry bread, he banged with his fist fit to split the Frenchman's table in two. I would have turned a sanguinary pirate for her, let alone cheating my way into the berth by dyeing my hair. So when you came to me with your chemist's wonderful stuff, he checked himself, by the way, that fellow's got a fortune when he likes to pick it up. It is a wonderful stuff. You tell him salt water can do nothing to it. It stays on as long as your hair will. All right, I said, go on. Thereupon he went for John's again with a fury that frightened his wife and made me laugh till I cried. Just you try to think what it would have meant to be at the mercy of the meanest creature that ever commanded a ship. Just fancy what a life that crawling Johns would have led me. 
and I knew that in a week or so the white hair would begin to show, and the crew, did you ever think of that, to be shown up as a low fraud before all hands. What a life for me till we got to Calcutta. And once there, kicked out, of course, half pay stopped, Annie here alone without a penny, starving, and I on the other side of the earth, ditto, you see? I thought of shaving twice a day, but could I shave my head too? No way, no way at all, unless I dropped John's overboard, and even then. Do you wonder now that with all these things boiling in my head, I didn't know where I was putting down my foot that night? I just felt myself falling, then crash and all dark. When I came to myself, that bang on the head seemed to have steadied my wits somehow. I was so sick of everything that for two days I wouldn't speak to anyone. They thought it was a slight concussion of the brain. Then the idea dawned upon me as I was looking at the ghost-ridden wretched fool. Ah, you love ghosts, I thought. Well, you shall have something from beyond the grave. I didn't even trouble to invent a story. I couldn't imagine a ghost if I wanted to. I wasn't fit to lie connectedly if I had tried. I just bulled him on to it. Do you know, he got quite by himself a notion that at some time or other I had done somebody to death in some way, and that, Oh, the horrible man, cries Mrs. Bunter from the sofa. There was a silence. And didn't he bore my head off on the home passage, began Bunter again in a weary voice. He loved me. He was proud of me. I was converted. I had had a manifestation. Do you know what he was after? He wanted me and him to make a seance, in his own words, and to try to call up that ghost, the one that had turned my hair white, the ghost of my supposed victim. And, as he said, talk it over with him, the ghost, in a friendly way. Or else, Bunter, he says, you may get another manifestation when you least expect it, and tumble overboard, perhaps, or something. You ain't really safe till we pacify the spirit world in some way. Can you conceive a lunatic like that? No, say. I said nothing, but Mrs. Bunter did in a very decided tone. Winston, I don't want you to go on board that ship again any more. My dear, says he, I have all my things on board yet. You don't want the things. Don't go near the ship at all. He stood still, dropping his eyes with a faint smile, said slowly in a dreamy voice, The haunted ship. And your last, I added? We carried him off as he stood by the night train. He was very quiet. But crossing the channel, as we two had a smoke on deck, he turned to me suddenly and, grinding his teeth, whispered, He'll never know how near he was being dropped overboard. He meant Captain Johns, I said nothing. But Captain Johns, I understand, made a great to-do about the disappearance of his chief mate. He set the French police scouring the country for the body. In the end, I fancy he got word from the owner's office to drop all this fuss, that it was all right. I don't suppose he ever understood anything of that mysterious occurrence. To this day, he tries, at times, he's retired now, and his conversation is not very coherent, he tries to tell the story of a black mate he once had, a murderous, gentlemanly ruffian, with raven black hair which turned white all at once, in consequence of a manifestation from beyond the grave, an avenging apparition. What with reference to black and white hair, to poop ladders, and to his own feelings in view, it is difficult to make head or tail of it. If his sister, she's very vigorous still, should be present, she cuts all this short, peremptorily. Don't you mind what he says. He's got devils on the brain.